Bob Donahue will lead us in opening prayer. Flag salute is right here, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Father, once again we convene as your children. We ask your blessing upon this meeting. The oak pack be true and right in everything that it does, according to your will and your natural laws. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Did y'all hear the Bon Jovi song while we were praying? Yeah. Living on a prayer. Um, if we could just cue that up every week. I tell you what, we are living on prayer. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to save commentary and announcements until the end of the program. Gary Jones has another place he needs to be at 1 o'clock. So we're going to get him up here to speak. He's our state auditor inspector. He's been the chairman of the state Republican Party. He knows dollars and cents. Sense in the money sense and sense in the common sense sense. So, Gary Jones, come on up. Thank you very much. Let me tell you that um, on Martin Luther King's birthday, I, uh, I found myself at the, at the Cash FFA, um, FFA barn helping my grandson clean out pig pens. And you notice I said pens instead of pen. And the reason was my daughter sent me with him to, and the ag teacher to Blair to buy him a show hog. Well, Grandpa came back with three. So I felt an obligation to help him. But it's amazing because as I'm sitting there cleaning out this pig pen, I'm thinking this, this has a lot of correlation between working at the Capitol. I said the only difference is, the only difference is when you get through cleaning out a pig pen, you have a sense of accomplishment. But, but that being said, um, I'm like a lot of you and a lot of other people across Oklahoma. I am upset. I'm mad because we thought that when Republicans took over that we would do it different. And what we found is in a lot of cases it's more of the same. And so, um, you know, I, I tend to be the guy that talks numbers. That's, that's what I do. And so the finances of the state of Oklahoma is, is you know, something that, that I see and, and I, uh, I, I said that, you know, you think when they do budgets in the state of Oklahoma, they should use generally accepted accounting principles, which is called GAAP. I said, but I think what they're using is creative representative accounting principles. And, and uh, so that, that being said, the numbers don't add up. They, they basically are using no type of math, no type of accounting that I understand because you can't identify an agency that has saved money in their operating account and give them permission to spend money they already have and call it an appropriation, and that's what they've done. So in many cases, when they talk about filling that hole, they, uh, they, they have done it with, with I, it's not even accounting tricks, because they, they, they've used creative math or whatever, but they, they basically lied on, on different things. and So it doesn't give you a true representation about what's going on. But I will tell you that there's multiple reasons why we're in the shape we're in. And someone said, is there a solution to, to cut as much expenses out as possible, or is it to raise revenue? And I said, the answer is yes. We've got to do both. I, I will tell you, there, there is waste in government, and that waste needs to be eliminated. The governor, about a year and a half ago, said that she put out an order that we need to work on reducing 10% of all the non-mission critical expenses. And I said, no. We should focus on eliminate 100% of all the non-mission critical expenses because if it's not critical to the mission, why are we spending it? You know, I, I, when I came into office, we had a chief of staff, a public relations person. We had we had a, a in in-house attorney, and you see all these different agencies. We don't have those anymore. We don't we don't have administrative assistance. What we have done is we've taken we we now have. Less people working for our agencies, but we have more auditors out in the field because that's our mission. That's what we do. And so because of that, we've been able to bring the cost down. We've actually got more done with less money. That's being conservative. And so uh, you sit there and you look at what's going on, and they're trying to figure out every way in the world that they can kick the can down the road to get out of here and say we funded government this way. Okay, and, and so... Now what we're looking at right now is last year they, they borrowed $200 million in bonds, so they didn't fund the uh, Department of, it, of Transportation. And now they're looking at doing something similar this year. So 
but there's no, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. How do you fix this problem? And I said the other day, what we need to do is we need to come up with a Dan Ramsey plan of fixing the Oklahoma state budget. And what that means is you eliminate every non-essential expense that you can have, and then you come back and he tells you, you've got to figure out a way to increase your revenue or your income. But the best way to increase revenue, as far as I'm concerned, is to fix the mistakes that they've made in the past by the inequities in the tax structure. You know, people ask, why in the world did we go from 7% tax on oil and gas down to 1? You know, 20 years ago, the state income tax was 7%. The tax on oil and gas was 7%. That was not by accident. It was by design. Now what we have is we've come down on the income tax to 5%. So I said, let's look at the numbers and let's go back and look. And, and on, on oil and gas, we have a 2% tax for the first three years. But the new method, what well, used to be new, is which is state-of-the-art, of horizontal drilling, they can go down and they can take 80% of the reserves out in three years. And then it goes to 7%. So what I said, and then, and then the tax commission last year had an estimate of what it was going to be 2%, what was going to be 7%, and the blended rate or, was 4.99. So I got to thinking 5%. But really, when you take all the additional credits they get, the real rate is 3.1. So I, I announced this week and put out, put out a press release on my tax plan, which I call the 555 Fair Tax Plan, that says that income tax will be 5%, tax on oil and gas will be 5% across the board, no additional credits, 5% tax on wind generation, because we spend a ton of money supporting the wind industry. It's about time we get some return back on our investment. And the other thing, too, is that we have, and actually it was a 4 by 5 but 5 5, five sounded better. The, the fifth one was that we have a five-year moratorium on tax credits that we, we do not renew anything until we have reviewed it, and they have voted to renew it, but it will not be a credit. It will be a rebate. It will be totally transparent so you know exactly who got it, how much, and you'd have a limit on how much they could cash in. Right now, there are literally hundreds of millions of dollars in tax credits. We can't tell you who has them. We can't tell you when they're going to cash them in. So how do you manage that? So what that does, it provides some, it provides some fairness to the tax code. It provides stability and some reassurance that we're actually going to have money necessary to run the core services of government after we've gone through to see that we do everything in the most cost-effective, efficient manner. There's some things in government right now that the people are not willing to afford anymore. We need to get rid of them. But that being said, when you're talking about a $900 million shortfall, if you can do some cuts and eliminate those things, I think we also would need to look at these huge raises that certain select agencies gave to the tune of twenty, thirty, forty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a few years ago. Those need to be rolled back. And because uh, what we have at the Capitol, and I was talking to to uh, the legislators, the, the uh, subcommittee on government appropriations, and they said, how would you absorb a 14.5 percent cut in your appropriations? I said, well, now that the fact when we first came in, we were 52 percent appropriated. We're now 29 percent appropriated, which means the 14.5 is going to be a much smaller part of our budget. So. You know, I, I guess what we'll do is the agencies that don't pay us will probably get slow played and we'll go out and get the ones that pay us to do. But other agencies don't fall in that category. But, but here's your situation. When you're allowing some agencies to give these huge raises, you know, how many of you read Animal House back when you were, okay, you know, in Animal House, everybody's equal. Some are more equal than others. And the pigs are the ones that the most, you know, they get everything. Well, we're at that situation right now. We've got certain select people that are being paid very well. As far as they're concerned, everything's great in government. But then we have other, other services out there like prison guards and things like that that, that are not paid a decent wage. And we need, to, we need to do everything we can to correct that. But, but that being said, I, uh, two weeks ago in Tulsa, uh, when I was getting, up, getting ready to talk to the Tulsa County Republican Party Convention, and I realized this will be the last time I have a chance to talk to one of their conventions before I'm term limited. So I said that I'm, I'm, I'm announcing today that I'm forming an exploratory committee to look at everything from going home and feeding cows and spending time with the grandkid to running, uh, grandkids to running for governor. Well, the part they heard was the running for governor part. But 
you know I'm having a good time right now talking about this because a lot of people are starting to listen. And I have no burning desire to be governor. I have no burning desire to, to live in the Capitol and be driven around by a chauffeur. I kind of like driving my own car. But I have this burning passion to try to fix some of this mess we find ourselves in because I got involved in politics and it was about the future of my kids and grandkids. And something I remember every day I go to work is that Dr. Coburn said that we are the first generation at risk of leaving the next generation worse off than we found it. Five years, ago, five years from now, I don't want to be looking back and saying that I didn't do everything I could in my power to try to fix things, and, uh, and, but I just walked away from it. So with that, I'll answer any questions you might have. And tell me what your thoughts are. Tell me privately, publicly. If you think that my best option is to go home and feed cows, hey, I get it. And, you know, I've got a great life at home, and that's starting to sound real attractive. Yes, sir. Hold on a second. I got the microphone. I'll be over there, Paul. Uh, question real quick. Borrowing money. You were talking about them balancing the budget. It seems like every year there's a multi-million dollar bond issue. In your view, are these bonds unconstitutional that they've been passing without a vote of the people? I, I think they are. I think that they should require a vote of the people. I think that, that what they've done is they figured out some way to circumvent the law to try to say it's, it's done by revenue bonds, different things like that. I don't believe that tax dollars would fit that requirement as far as a revenue bond. I think they should be voted on. If you were governor, what would you do about that? Would you just straight up veto any budget that came to you with bonded indebtedness in it and make that point to the people? I, I, what I would do is I would do everything I could to, to sit down with them and say, listen, this is what we need to do. If we want to do a general bond, let's put it together and let's put it out to a vote of the people. Another point you made is that we really need to cut departments and agencies that are improper functions of government. How can we accomplish that when that's the the job of the legislature and they aren't brave enough to do it for fear of their jobs what ideas do you have on that well someone asked me the question the other day how in the world do you think you can get anything done in the state capitol with the house and the senate because we have a weak governorship i said here's here's the way you do it what you do is you bring them in members of leadership and say and democrats and republicans and everybody and you say what we're going to do is we're going to sit down and we're going to have workshops and we're going to come up with the ten things that we want done, that we believe are core services of government, we're going to get them done. And then what you do is you get you at least a third of either body that really buys into that concept. And you say, here's what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to band together because if you do anything other than this that's not a core service of government, I'm going to veto it. Because, and same thing with the budget. When you come back with the budget at the end of the year and they, they slap an extra, they tell you that they've cut the appropriation for the House and Senate by 25%, but they don't mention the Legislative Service Bureau, which just feeds money into them. They funnel $9 million in that, so they actually increased their budget. And the governor said, I don't know what to do because it was last minute. If I vetoed it, we'd have to have a special session. I'd say, folks, you do that to me, we will have a special session because they furnished me a very nice house over here two blocks away, and we'll be here year-round if it, if it means that we have to be here to get it right. Now, in the newspaper, on the television, the press releases, I've heard a thousand times in the last year the phrase core service or core function of government, and then they immediately list anything under the sun as a core function of government. Could you define that from your perspective? Uh, Basically, it's, it's, it's the, the functions that, that we agree on that need to be a function of government, roads and bridges, uh, public safety, education, because it does say in our Constitution that we have an obligation to educate students. Um, all those different things that fall under that. Now, all these different things that are, that are different, and this is what I would do is say what we're going to do is – we're going to go through and we're going to fund core services to the correct level. Uh, several years ago, a couple of years ago, I was walking down the hall and Preston Dorflinger stopped me and said, great article in the Washington Times. I said, Preston, what are you talking about? He said, you're quoted throughout this article in the Washington Times. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I know Ralph Hallow from the Washington Times. I used to have dinner with him when I was on the RNC, but I haven't talked to him in three years. So he said, let me send you this article. The article says, Fed should follow Oklahoma's lead on budget. And then it goes through and says, Governor Fallon's auditor, Gary Jones, has proposed a needs-based budgeting, which is a modified version of zero-based budgeting, is how you should do it. Because basically it's a great way to reduce the size of government in a painless way because you fund those core services like you should. And then the bottom line says, 
uh, Washington, are you listening? The problem is we're not doing it in Oklahoma. In fact, they announced a year ago that they're, they're, we're going to get away from this antiquated version of zero-based budgeting and go to a performance-informed budgeting. And I'm going, you never did zero-based budgeting. And what you did is you bought a $5 million computer program where you put a few milestones in there and you, you measure those and you call that performance-informed budgeting. It doesn't do your budget. So that being said, we will fund all those things to the proper level. And then what we're going to find is that all those things that don't fall into that category, there will be no money for that. I'm not a court, I'm not sure. Well, thank you for coming here first. Okay. I'm not sure whether it's in the Constitution or what, but as I understand it, there's only certain things that the auditor can audit on his own. Right. Is, do you think there's any chance of somebody and maybe a new governor getting a law, uh, something passed to allow whoever takes over as auditor to audit, audit anything that gets public money? I think that that if I'm governor, I'll try to get something like that passed. But if you can't get that done, one of the methods by which that those audits can be asked for is by the governor. And so I'll I'll start going through and looking at, you know, the the department, the the uh, uh, higher education. Back in the late 80s, they asked to do, and back then either the speaker or the pro tem could ask for audits. Now it's the speaker and the pro tem. It got changed in 04 when Democrats re realized the Republicans were taking over. There's never been a request. There was a request to audit uh, uh, higher ed universities. The first two that got audited, the presidents went to prison. The next two, the bookstore managers went to prison. So instead of saying, well, you need to continue doing this, the legislature said, that's, that's good, you've done a great job, but don't do any more. And there's never been another request since then. I see a couple of pieces of low-hanging fruit on the budget that should produce some savings, one of which is uh, the use of drugs. To me, the government has no right to say what an individual can put into his or her body. Okay. That's up to the individual until they uh, bother someone else with the result of taking the drugs. And that would empty out uh, lots of prisons. It would save a lot of money on uh, welfare for the uh, prisoners' families, save a lot of money in court costs and a lot of uh, other uh, incidental expenses associated with drug use. Also, um, the arts. That's A-R-T-S for those of you that don't speak Bostonian. Sure. Um, <laughs> The Jupacica? Yeah, okay. that's where I come from. Yeah. It seems to me that the uh, supplying money for the arts is certainly not yeah. let me, uh, let me go ahead a, a government function. Because we're short of time, but let me say, say this. We did an audit on corrections, and in our audit what we said in the summary was that while you the, – the laws have been passed to reflect that we're going to be tough on crime – you're not willing to put the money necessary to, to, to support that. So wouldn't a better solution to be smart on crime and that we quit locking up the people that we're mad at and lock up the ones we're afraid of and develop programs to either get them treatment to keep them from that revolving door or get them out there working to pay taxes to support their family? That makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah. Uh, Gary, yes. you know the cost of running a statewide race, right. but auditor is much less than a governor's race. Sure. So number one is what kind of money do you have on hand that you could transfer? Sure. And my second question is, uh, have you considered a run for state treasurer as that will also be open? And would that be an arena that would fit your skill set also if you decide not to run for governor? Right. And and. and I'll be the first to tell you that money is the biggest option uh, obstacle ahead of me. And this is one thing, too. I have never, ever been one to go gather money for the purpose of having money. So that being said, I have about two $2,500 in my campaign account. I, have not, I, do, I don't travel around in a state-provided vehicle around the state collecting money from, from people and, and, and going to campaign events. That makes nor, it sound nor, like someone nor, does. Nor, nor, nor would I ever do that. The other thing, too, let me, let me tell you the biggest problem we have with the state of Oklahoma right now as far as tax policy. Tax policy in the state of Oklahoma is now being developed by career politicians, and donors. They work out tax policy. The problem there is there's nobody there representing the citizens of Oklahoma at that table. 
And, you know, I, uh, I have no illusions that I can win this without raising some money. I can win it with a third of the money that anybody else does based on reputation, grassroots, and others. And then actually, i got a coalition of support that's not your traditional Republican support because I've been fair. They said, you know what, you've been the one guy that's been fair. That's, that's, that's what we're there to be. So that being said, I haven't made the decision to run. Well, I, I, it doesn't have to be me. You, you probably follow me on Facebook or Twitter. Okay, don't. Well, I posted the other day. I got up early, in, uh, and early for me is about 4.30. And I'm sitting there thinking, and it came to me, and I'm praying. And I'm going, okay. And I type in, note to self, it's not about you. If somebody else gets out there that has a message that I believe in, that I think has a reasonable chance of winning, I'll probably be with them. But if not, then I'm not going to leave the future of my kids and grandkids to the fact that somebody happened to shake down more donors than I did. Because the the method or the the, the message out there and, and I may run just to change the debate. Just to change the debate, to get out there and say, hey, listen, I, I, I know you say this. You've got, you've got a corporate foundation out here that is now putting together your plans. And not only do you have all these donors and corporate money and you've got all these advantages, but does it make you the most qualified person? So maybe we can change that debate. Someone said, how are you going to get your 555? The legislature never go for it. I said, there's a crazy thing called initiative petition, and maybe that's what I need to do. And I said, here's another thing, too. If you know how to negotiate, and I think we know what, you know, there's a president that got elected mainly a lot of having to do with the fact that people think he knows how to negotiate. So if we're going to bother to go through and circulate a petition to do a 5% tax on oil and gas, it's real easy to change the 5 to a 7, which some people are suggesting. So maybe they might say, you know what, 5 might not be too bad. So that being said, it's about... The future of my kids and grandkids, not necessary. As far as treasurer, the treasurer spends about a third of their time. I mean, it's, it's, it's a job where you don't really have. What I had said a while back was that I would run for treasurer if I thought that the person being elected governor would appoint me to run state finance too because it's been done. The first time you do that, you saved a quarter million dollars for the state of Oklahoma. And, in fact, if I became governor, I, I, I'd go to the treasurer and see if they had the qualifications. Said, you run state finance. We've saved a quarter million dollars. Go to the lieutenant governor and said, hey, what are your skill sets? If your skill sets are where you're a promotional person, let's put you in charge of tourism and eliminate that job and save another $200,000. So let's look at trying to do what we can to reduce the size of government. Idea. Mr. Jones, my name is Jerome, and yeah. let's suppose that you decide to run, right. and let's suppose that you win and become governor. Right. Now let's suppose that there is a convention of the states that two-thirds of the states push for this constitu constitutional convention. What do you think would be the outcome if there was a constitutional convention? Do you think it would really modify our constitution and really get ugly and nasty and change it a lot? Well, what, what I understand about that is that part of it depends on whether or not you've limited the scope of what could be looked at. And if you do that in such a way that maybe you could do it where it doesn't become a runaway convention, it ends up being something different than what you intended. But that's, that's what little bit I have studied on that. You have to limit that scope to what you can do. Otherwise, you need to be careful what you wish for. Just FYI, according to a report by Congress, they can't limit it. So that's one of the, well, the concerns we have. That, that's my concern. That would, that would be my concern. I'm Jim, and uh, you, you're I, I know you, Jim. I know. I served under you in the 4th District. You and, did. And uh, you're a statesman, sir. You're saying the same things now that you said then. And what about 4th District Congress? You know, Cole's got... Got an Achilles heel. You know, I, I, I have been a migrant worker since about 2002, which means that I travel up here to Oklahoma City and I travel back on weekends. I've been to Washington. The problem with that is you, you'd be dealing with 148 other people trying to manage the government in the state of Oklahoma. Look what you'd be dealing on the federal level. So the, the likelihood of me making a difference it's probably greater in the state of Oklahoma than it would be in Washington. I have no desire to be. I, I've never belonged to a fraternity. 
I did go to their parties because they had nice parties. But, <laughs> but, um, but, but anyway, I have no desire to be part of the fraternity. I, I measure, you know, someone says, what, do you, what will you look back on and determine your success? I said, it's accomplishments. You know, I, I posted on Facebook and I said, you know, I, I think that you should have to, you know, people are called honorable. Someone sends me something that says honorable. No, getting one more, elect, one more vote on election day does not make you honorable. That should be something you earn. And so we treat our politicians like they're royalty. They're supposed to be representing us. And, and we make it too easy, too comfortable for them. And, and it's time that everybody sacrifice, including the elected officials. So. Amen and hear, hear. Okay. I, we want to keep our best and brightest here, not in the cesspool of Washington. One, one more question. I, I, this is the last I, question. I actually had another deal scheduled before I just said I'd come here. Yeah. Uh, Gary, you had a big job to do when you took over as a state auditor. What today is the, say, the financial and legal health of our local governments, the county and city? And, well, well I, 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 it, it's much better because what we found, we were five years behind on a lot of audits. We were caught up, and what we found is that the mistakes that were made unintentional, that the majority of people are trying to correct them, the ones that were intentional, a lot of them have been indicted or, and on their way to prison. And so a lot of other people know that the likelihood, you know, we're the people's watchdog. The likelihood of them getting caught has gone up tremendously, so the likelihood of them doing it has gone down. So that being said, we have a, we have a more accountable, transparent uh, system out there that people can can rely on better than we can. Not saying that there's not things that need to be changed or things that need to be looked at, but it's a lot better than it was. So, guys, I got to run. Thank you very much. Appreciate. It. All right. So that concludes the first half of our program. And now, doing things backwards, we are on to announcements and things we need to talk about of local interest and flair. Next week, our program here is a discussion of the death penalty, how it works and maybe doesn't work in Oklahoma. Uh, that'll be interesting. Our speaker will be Mark Hyden. I actually don't know what in detail his positions are. I don't know what in detail my positions are. I know that there's nothing inherently wrong with the death penalty, and God calls for a life for life and for justice on earth. So I don't have a problem with the death penalty, but it is always worth discussing and debating how we should carry that out and what policy is. So I think that'll be interesting. Let's see. Let me say another word about the Article 5 Convention of the States. If you didn't read my article last week, maybe I didn't make it clear enough, and I just want to reiterate for the record here that the purpose of Article 5 in our Constitution is to give us a way to change that Constitution. Well, we need a way to change it. So there's nothing inherently wrong with Article 5 of the Constitution. There's nothing inherently wrong with changing the Constitution. In fact, I'm really glad that we have added many of the amendments that we have to our Constitution, especially the first ten, known as the Bill of Rights. Others need to go, but others are great. And we wouldn't have been able to do that without Article 5. But again, the purpose of the Article 5 is to change it, not to enforce it. Now, currently, the discussion involving Article 5 and having a compact of states or a convention of states is all about trying to enforce the Constitution. How do we get Congress to actually follow what's in there? Amending it and changing it doesn't enforce it. These are two completely different functions. You're comparing apples to oranges. You're using the wrong tool for the job. If you want Congress to follow the Constitution, adding another amendment doesn't fix it. The only possible way you have to enforce it is to actually physically, literally do actions in our states that defy the federal government, push back against it, and punish them and protect the people. We can't just write words on paper. We actually have to arrest people. We have to have passed laws that will allow us to prosecute federal criminals, etc. That's known as enforcing state sovereignty. That's the only way we will ever push back against the federal government. And in my view, we should not support any candidate for governor next year unless he or she gets that and is willing to run on that platform. Any governor not willing to do that, as well-intentioned as they may be, will not make things any better or freer in our state unless they're willing to push back. That's the bottom line. 
There is a bill in the House right now. It came over from the Senate. It's called SB 393. It is the Science and Education Act. And I haven't read it. I don't know the details in there. But I know it says something along the lines of we need to be able to uh, explain to the kids that evolution is not a fact. It's a theory and it has problems. Well, I think that's important that we should do that. At the same time, guys, it's just a Band-Aid. I mean, even if we get the thing passed, we don't have any reason to jump up and down and celebrate. Fundamentally, the problem is that we've left government in charge of pretty much all education for everybody in the state. It is a monopoly of secular humanists. So we pass things all the time, telling agencies and departments what to do, and they don't do it. Many years ago, we passed a Parental Bill of Rights and Education Act, and they routinely violate it and go against it. There's just not good enough enforcement mechanisms in so many things that we passed, have passed. So while I think evolution is a false lie and has led to terrible problems in our culture, passing this bill may not do anything in the long run anyway. The fact of the matter is evolution is so full of holes, it's worse than Swiss cheese. It's more like a screen uh, with all kinds of holes in it from the cat. It cannot explain irreducible complexity. It can't explain the fossil record of all these fossils being in the same layers and all jumbled up. And the fact that it looks like life on Earth came into existence in a plethora of different species all at once in an explosion of life. And it's since then we haven't been gaining new higher species. We've been losing species. Everything is completely opposite and backwards of what evolution teaches. And so just passing a bill that says we should say that it's a theory and, and not fact, great, let's do it. I hope we do. Uh, but is it really going to make a difference? I don't know. The problem is government education at its core. So here's the status of that bill. Right now it is in a House committee. There's eight people on that committee. I can't remember the name of it. Does anybody know off the top of your head? No, it's not common education. It's in a different one. Here you've got Fought, McDougal, Murphy, and Calvi are on this committee. Ford, Babinick, Munson, and Tadlock are on this committee. So the way I have it figured is you've got four who would definitely vote in favor of it. Fought, McDougal, Murphy, and Calvi. Munson and Tadlock, probably not. I don't know. They're Democrats. The ones that I think may be on the fence, I don't know where they stand, would be Ford and Babinick. So when you get ready to make phone calls this afternoon or if you're going to swing by the Capitol on the way home, I would focus on Ford and Babinick and ask them where they stand on SB 393 and get them to vote yes so we can get it out for a floor vote. Father God, we just thank you for this uh, uplifting time today, a time to talk about your kingdom and about and, and to be thankful to you, Lord, for placing us here to do your work. We thank you for Gary Jones and ask that you would help him as he ponders his future and decisions for his life. And we just pray that also for other of your children in our state who we would like to see in leadership. We just thank you for the opportunity you give each of us to live according to your principles and to apply them where you have placed us. We pray for your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to represent that well in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.